Lane, 429, a good marching song on a cold Wednesday night. Onward, Christian soldiers. Let's stand together and sing. Everybody standing, Brother Bob will lead us. Onward, Christian soldiers, marching as to war. With the cross of Jesus going on before. I appreciate so much Brother Yoder and his willingness to go uh, to that area of India. That, that particular area, Odisha, um, 2008, so it had been about nine years ago, they, they had... Uh, some folks killed, Christians. Uh, the, the opposition got very fierce there, and uh, they went on a rampage, and uh, it was several years before anybody would even openly say they were a Christian. Uh, they, they still had some meetings, but it was very secretive and very underground, and they just in the last few years have begun to uh, be public about it again. So I uh, uh, really appreciate his willingness to go. And uh, I didn't tell you about that before you went. I thought I'd tell you after you went. <laughs> His wife is saying, what? No. Uh, and uh, that's when I remember that, that pastor talking to me. He was at the pastor's conference two years ago in India when we went to the South India Baptist Bible College. And um, that's how the contact was there. And um, just uh, exciting to see that. What you saw there is about... Um, what did we figure, 3,000 miles or so from where I was in India? Uh, completely the other side of the, of the country. And uh, just, just amazing. Uh, what, and there were, you know, there were some pastors who made that trip. And you understand traveling there is not like traveling here. Uh, different, different altogether. Uh, but Brother Yoder asked him to just go ahead and share some more with us about his trip to India, things that maybe he'd like us to, to know and uh, things that the uh, Lord's maybe spoke to his heart about and that uh, he would share with us. So he's going to take the rest of our time this evening and uh, just share his heart with us. Okay? Brother Dave. If you would, please turn in your Bible to 1 John chapter 5. What I'd like to do tonight is I want to primarily just talk about some blessings that the Lord gave me and showed me while I was there. And uh, so let's, let's look at 1 John chapter 5, and we'll read verse 20. And we know that the Son of God has come and hath given us an understanding that we may know him that is true, and we are in him that is true even in His Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. As we look at this verse right here, it tells us exactly who God is. Uh, when you're dealing with a country where they have over a million gods, they want to <clears throat> just add more gods to their collection so that uh, they have all the bases covered, and then when they die, they'll be accepted into their uh, next level of uh, eternity. But we know from the Bible that that is not true at all. And so when dealing with these people, you have to let them know who God is, because obviously they can't be saved if they don't know who God is. I would like for you to turn to one other place, and then I'll pray, and then I'll share just a little bit of testimony with you. Please turn to Isaiah chapter 43. Isaiah chapter 43, and we'll read verse 7. Isaiah 43, 7. Even every one that is called by my name, for I have created him for my glory. I have formed him, yea, I have made him. So, once a person knows who God is, then they have to ask the question, well, what am I doing here? What is my purpose? And so many of the things that I taught and preached in India uh, springboarded from these uh, verses because, again, you can't just go 
uh, right to the Romans road and start from there because they have no idea what you're even talking about. So most of the time I would start with a verse similar to this to get their wheels thinking and then we would start in Genesis and talk about the fall of man and just go right on through to where it brought them in their present day life. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your kindness and your many blessings to us. Uh, Lord, it's very difficult for us to understand, growing up with a Bible in our hand, what other nations go through. But we are so thankful about that, and we thank you that you used Bible Baptist Church uh, to send me and do the work in India. And I want to tell you ahead of time, anything that I say uh, or that I mention, Lord, I want it for your honor and your glory and not for myself. I love you very much. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So I could stand up here for a long, long time and tell you about the many, many blessings that God brought my way. And the first one I have already mentioned, and that was concerning the attendance. Now, when you're, when you're a Baptist preacher, <laughs> you look at those numbers, and they would tell us how many people that we could anticipate, and we always had more. Every single service we had more. We would have uh, Hindus from the community come in, just a few, but they would come in and they would sit and they would listen. We had, uh, I believe it was four different cab drivers, and they would come, and they would listen to the preaching. Most of the time, you hired them for the whole day. And this was, this was one of the things that um, began to work on us with the financial problems that I mentioned. When I landed, you know, they had a, a money exchange place right in the airport, and I told them how much I wanted exchanged, and they said, well, the limit on that is $85. You can only have $85 exchanged into rupees. Well, it cost us right, right at 170 rupees to, or right at $170 to get from the airport to where we were going. And then... Um, Nobody would take American money. Nobody would take American credit cards. The bank would not deal with us at all. Any vendors that you talk to, if you mention something, the price automatically went up. <laughs> it didn't come down. And so after we were there just two or three days, uh, we were out of money, and we were not sure how we were going to get it. We had ahead of time established what we were going to do with the Bibles. We had taken... Uh, the Western put the money in the Western Union and sent it to me in my name. And we got that right, right from the start so that we would not have any problems with the Bibles. Again, the only thing was the Bibles were about a thousand kilometers from where we were staying, so we had to pay to get those picked up and delivered to us. And it was just one thing right after another. But God, the Lord, did take care of us. Something that was amazing was the whole time I was there, I did not get sick. Uh, I, you know, I did not know what I was eating. I'm not one of these guys that is a human garbage disposal and can just eat anything. Um, I, I'm not picky. You, you can't be picky when you're a missionary. But um, I did not get sick over the food that I ate. There was different times where I did drink the water. And I was okay. Um, there, there, there was nothing that could be done. Sometimes you just you had to do those things, and God protected. On my last prayer letter, I, I put down specifically to please pray for my throat and my vocal cords. Uh, for many years, and Ed could tell you this, for many, many years I've had trouble with my voice. And after I was there about two days, because um, after the first two days, I thought, man, this is not going to be good. Till the, till the time the pastor's conference comes, I'm not even going to be able to talk. But after the first two days, it was just like the Lord turned back the hands of time on my voice. And my voice got stronger and stronger every day. This is after preaching twice a day. And then 
Um, because we would start off in the morning when these guys would come in and bring me breakfast and coffee. Then they'd invite a whole bunch of people in my room, you know. And, and we'd have, uh, we'd have uh, Bible questions and conference, and we'd talk for, you know, an hour or so straight. And then we'd go from there uh, to preaching and working with the people in the villages. And <clears throat> my voice was as strong as it's ever been when we started the conference. Uh, after I preached those eight times and... And by the, 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 the night of the last uh, conference day, my voice was pretty well gone. But we only had three days left. And the next day, we only had one village. And so I preached, and it was, they had set up a, they had basically set up a tent or something, I don't know what it was, that was over the street, because it was at night. We didn't go there until 8.30 at night. And I went in there, and the tent was just packed out with people. Uh, again, I, when, I'm, when I say something is packed out, I'm talking very small structures, but people sitting literally on top of each other. So if I'm talking about a room, I'm talking about maybe from here to the end of the platform, and only, only this wide right up here. That was the whole room, and, they would, and they'd get 30 to 40 people in that area. And you'd, they'd be right next to your feet, and you're preaching right there on top of them. But here's the thing. You could never really tell how many people were there because then there would be people sitting on the steps and people out in the street. So if you're preaching in the dark, and who knows how many Hindus are out there listening. So, man, you just let her go and, and, and preach the word. And... Uh, that's, that's what I did, service after service after service, and the Lord allowed my voice to be strong. And again, I cannot explain what kind of a miracle that was, but my wife certainly knows that, that it was a miracle. And the guy that was traveling with me, he said, I cannot believe how strong your voice is and how it's holding up. The Lord... I mentioned that the Lord was just working in an incredible way. This guy that was with me, he was, um, he's been in church all of his life as well. <laughs> and three different times he told me, Brother Yoder, that is the best message I have ever heard in my life. <laughs> and, and so it was just, the Holy Spirit was just working, and the people were under conviction. And Every, they were focusing on every word that you said. And if you'd move a little bit, their eyes were right on you. And they were so hungry for the Word of God and for the truth. And it was a real blessing. There were people saved in every single service but one. We went into this uh, village, and they told us ahead of time, there's very few Christians in this village. It's very, very wicked. And so we went into a, a lady's house, and they said, we want to introduce you to the first Christian in this village. There's very few, but we want to introduce to you the first uh, Christian. So the lady left, and she came back, <coughs> and she was carrying her son. Her son was about 25 years old, and from the waist down, his, his legs were about that big around. They didn't work at all. And so he just sat on the floor, Indian style, and uh, listened to the preaching, and, and there were some Muslims from the, not Muslims, there were some Hindu from the street that came in, and three young men, and they got under great conviction during the service. I preached uh, that particular service on Mark chapter 2, how Jesus healed the paralytic, and uh, preached where Jesus had, was specifically saying, you know, you know, which is greater, to heal somebody physically or to heal, heal them spiritually? And uh, looking right at him when I was preaching and everything, then when it was time for the invitation, I said, if you'd like to receive Jesus as your Savior, just raise your hand. And they all three lifted up their head and looked at me. And I said again, if you'd like to receive Jesus as your Savior... Let, let me know by raising your hand. And they looked at each other, and they put their heads back down. And that was the only service where we did not have anyone saved. 
the Lord was very good to us as we traveled. Uh, we had safety on the road and in the airplanes. There was a couple different times where we had some very close calls uh, driving. You know, there was a, a, a guy, a cab driver that took us when we were in Armenia. And um, Ron knows the fellow that's the cab driver there. And he was driving us in a little Opal. There was five of us in the Opal. And he was going over 130 kilometers an hour. And a guy pulled right out in front of us. And uh, how we missed him, my answer is the Lord. <laughs> because we, we should have T-boned that guy big time and, and the Lord protected us. And then in, in India, one time we were between a, uh, a wall, a cement wall, and a bus. And we had our little car in there and uh, just the Lord took care of us. I don't know how we got out of it, but we did. I learned to pray more when I was in India, not because of bad situations, but again, this is difficult for us to understand. It's not that the people had very little, it's that the people had nothing. And if you don't have anything, the only thing you can do is pray. So, Every 15 seconds, they were praying about something. And it, it got me to look at my own life, how much I take for granted, and how much uh, I just receive the blessings of living in America that other people do not have, and they just pray about everything. And so it helped me, and I, I did spend a lot of time in my motel room, but I spent a lot of time praying, a lot of time studying, a lot of time thanking God for this church. God blessed us as we went through customs. Uh, we got off the airplane, and it, it was a, a big concern of us because a lot of people said the Indian government will give you trouble. And Brother um, Brother Bowman that got back from India in October, he said that customs almost sent him back on the plane back home again. And so we were worried about that. And we got off the plane, and they said, go over here to the customs area. And we went over there, and there was lines everywhere with people. And you could see the guys, you know, giving it to the <laughs> people coming through. And so we kind of looked at each other and said, well, which line are we going to choose? About that time, a uh, security officer uh, came up to both of us and said, you two come with me. Well, you know, <laughs> oh, oh ye of little faith, I'm thinking, here we go. <laughs> he said, you come with me. And so he took us clear to the other side of the airport, and he said, go through these two lines right here. And it wasn't, it wasn't even a custom security line. It was just two officers sitting in little desks. They didn't ask us any questions. They just said, let us have your passport. And they stamped it, and we went on through. <laughs> and uh, that, those kinds of things, that's the Lord. Uh, there's, there's, you can't work that up. You can't do anything. And, and God took good, good care of us that way. We had uh, the same type of a thing happen uh, during inspections. We were very, very close to uh, missing one of our planes because of uh, delays, we, we, we had many connecting flights, and on one, we, we got on the plane, and they said, okay, we're going to be leaving here, and we're going to start about 20 minutes early. Everyone that has a ticket is on the plane, and we're going to get you there a little bit early. Well, over an hour and a half later, we were still sitting on the runway, <laughs> and so we uh, had some difficulty making it in time to our next uh, plane, and again, the same kind of a thing happened. A fellow came up to us and said, uh, you two fellows come with me. And, you know, when you go through the security uh, of the, uh, where they, they check you with a wand and you send all your bags through and, and all this and that, uh, he took us through a, a, a first class line where we were the first ones in line. In, in five minutes, we were through and finished. 
I did get to have many Bible studies in my motel, and uh, I was always trying to think, um, how can I help these guys? How can I help these guys? They were very discouraged. They were very scared. Um, the, the fact of the persecution is real. Uh, the Hindus rule everything. It was during election time. Things are a lot more rowdy during that time. Uh, they take their election seriously. One guy that did not win his election killed himself. Uh, and, and what they do is they, they get the young people involved and try to get them on their side, and, and they make a big, big deal out of it. There was a, a, a Christian that was uh, severely wounded while I was there uh, for handing out Bibles. Uh, they were pretty sure, unless God intervened, he was not going to make it. Uh, so we're talking about people that are uh, scared with good reason. But see, you can't, you can't live your Christian life that way. If you're in those kind of conditions, or if you're here, if you have a, a boss that has a big mouth and hates all Christians, you can't be scared. God does not give a spirit of fear. What you have to do is you have to uh, ask God to give you courage, and you get courage by believing what he said in his word. And so I was constantly holding that in front of them. God will take care of you. You do what God told you to do, and you'll be okay. This is just an average. The time I was there, I got to preach to about 900 different people. As I mentioned, uh, there in India, we had 164 that were saved. One of the highlights <coughs> was uh, we wanted to have a youth meeting. Well, we, I wanted to have two things. I wanted to have a youth meeting, and I also wanted to have uh, an outdoor assembly uh, because you can get people from the community, and uh, you can preach to a lot of people at once. But... There was only one area where an outdoor assembly would have been possible, and I could not get any of the uh, national pastors to back it. They said the, 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 the risk is just too great. And so I prayed about it, and the Lord decided that we should not do that, so that did not happen. But another thing that we wanted to do is we wanted to have a little youth conference. There was one of the men that were helped that was helping me every day. He was a college student. He would do his college work in the morning and then he'd come help us for the rest of the day. Oftentimes he would meet us in the village on his motorcycle. And he invited his friends to come and listen. So we had a meeting one evening with 18 college men that attended. 17 were unsaved and 17 were Hindu. A uh, couple of the pastors said, we have no idea what you're going to tell these people because they're not going to listen to anything that you say. Uh, the Lord guided me to turn to Ezekiel 37 with the valley of uh, dry bones. And I preached a message, the valley of dry young men. And I told them how that their life without Christ was dry their life with these false gods was dry, and they had no purpose in life, and told them how that the Lord, and through his power, they could be filled with energy and have a purpose in their life. And when we were finished, all 17 were saved. <laughs> so that was a, a definite highlight. And then, again, going to these uh, pastors, it was just an incredible thing to hear these pastors, after I was finished preaching, they would come up to me and say, thank you so much for preaching that message. That was exactly the one that I had been praying about for months that you would bring to my people. And I had, I had no idea of knowing that. I didn't even know who they were. But the Lord was working and helping them. I want to tell you a story that it, it bothers me, but I will, I will tell it to you anyhow. 
as we got closer and closer to the pastor's conference, again, they, had, they did not have anything like this at all ever in that area. There were some white people that had come from time to time, but as far as they knew, there was no uh, white Christians and certainly Baptist, uh, of uh, independent Baptist like us. And so as we got closer and closer to that conference time, uh, the, the pressure of the devil was getting greater and greater. And you could, you could feel that um, what we were doing was causing quite a stir. And that's one of the reasons why they would not let us get out of our motel. They said the risks are just too great. And we would laugh about it and say, you know, well, can't we just go to buy our own breakfast or whatever or go for a walk and... I told them how they were killing me, you know, because I was getting fat, just sitting and doing nothing and all this and that. And they laughed about it, but they said, no, you, you, can't, you can't go out. Because if they find out where you are and what you're doing, uh, it's going to be nothing but trouble. So we stayed in there. Two days before the conference, we went to this village. And one of the things that we did, we, we would... We would meet the people. Sometimes they would give us a little snack. Uh, again, don't ask me what it was because I don't know. Um, we'd have snack and some coffee and something like that. And then just kind of a meet and greet situation. And then I would preach to them. And then when I got done preaching, they would, uh, many of the people would come up to me and ask me if I would pray for them. They'd say, I'm having this physical problem. Uh, would you pray for me? Um, the pastor would say, we need a church building desperately. Would you pray about that with us? Or they would take me to an area of land and say, we want this land so that we can build a church. Please pray for us. And so we were praying all the time after, after we got done preaching. Well, I got done with this service, and it was a great service. I preached probably an hour and a half, two hours. I preached on faith. And God moved in a miraculous way. Probably half the people that attended got saved. And so they said, uh, the neighbor would like for you to come and pray for his house. Well, again, you have the buildings. The, building, the houses were all um, long. They almost looked like an apartment situation to where the side walls connected to the apartment beside it. Okay. Well, the end was where the church was. So basically, it had three walls, and we were preaching in there, and then I went over to the next place to where the neighbor was. The church was fairly open, fairly light, and everything like that. But we went to this neighbor's house. The roof came down to about here, you know, sticks and everything. And so we ducked down in and went inside there, their room. Well, as I mentioned, they're very narrow and they're not very long. The poorer they are, the smaller they are. So we went into his room and the, the translator came in with me, the neighbor came in, Doug came in, and a couple other people. And so uh, I, I said, okay, what is it that you need? <laughs> and all of a sudden, he got this look of panic on his face. And as soon as I walked in there, if you've been in the ministry very long, sometimes you get this feeling that, man, something's wrong. And so he said, we really need you to pray for our house. We got a snake in here. I said, what? <laughs> he, said, well, he said, we got a snake in here, and we need you to pray for our house. Because he comes out at night and he's scaring my children and my wife. I'm thinking, man, what do you think he's doing to me? <laughs> and so he said, uh, you know, we, we need you to pray that, that we can kill him. And every time at night when, when he comes out, during the day he hides and we can't find him. And then... There's somebody that keeps knocking on our door at night, and we go to open the door, and there's nobody there. And we're scared. Please pray for us. So I bowed my head, and 
I'm telling you, I wanted to <laughs> start looking around. But, but right then the Lord said, no, you just preached on faith for two hours. What are you doing? So I prayed and I said, God, I'd, I'd ask that you'd please protect this family and help them to be able to kill this snake and have these problems go away. And so we prayed for them and we left. That night I got back to my motel and I just said, God, I can't imagine if that was my family and it was my girls. He had three or four children, young children, a beautiful wife. And so I just said, God, please take care of this problem for them. Two days later, his pastor came to the, the pastor's conference. And I went up to him and I said, well, were they able to get the snake? They said, yeah, that night he came out and they killed him. And it was a big cobra. And I, I was so thankful that the Lord answered my prayers. But I know that it was you folks that were praying for me. My wife was praying for me constantly. And the devil did not want what happened during that pastor's conference to happen. You know, you saw some of the pictures. The pictures cannot describe what it was when you see uh, a whole auditorium full of preachers rushing to the altar to ask God to give them courage to do what he called them to do. And uh, just an unbelievable thing. God has been so kind to me. Uh, I'm not really sure why he lets me do what I do going to these different countries and preaching to these people but he has and so I just want to thank him tonight and uh, just remind you that when you pray for me and you pray for our ministries it's not prayer in vain it's it's the real deal All right, thank you Wow, that's great, isn't it? Man, I'm glad glad we had a part in that, and that's a blessing, Brother Dave. Thank you for being faithful to the Lord, and uh, we're excited about what God's doing and uh, praying for the next opportunity and where the Lord will send you. And uh, But that's great. Pray for these men in India. Will you remember to do that? Uh, this is, uh, the, the test isn't when they're at a conference, you know, and get to hear and the inspiration, it's now that they're back in their villages and doing the work and ministering to their people that uh, the Lord will continue to sustain them and they'll look to the Lord uh, for that help and strength. And uh, that's, that's wonderful. Praise the Lord. And uh, that's good. Well, I'm glad I came tonight. Aren't you? And uh, it's been good to be in the house of the Lord. Let's stand together for prayer, shall we? Father, thank you for this evening. Lord, thank you so much for what you have done there in India and also Armenia with Brother Yoder and Lord the ministry of 1040 International and what you're continuing to develop with Brother Moreland and that ministry and God we pray that you'll continue to guide and direct uh, Lord I pray that we you will show Brother Yoder the next place that you would have him to go to minister to pastors and to train the national pastors Lord to be effective in in reaching their villages and their towns and their cities for christ thank you for people halfway around the world that love you and serve you with all their heart lord what a what a great time heaven's going to be when we get to be with all these believers that uh, we know nothing about thank you for your blessing upon us thank you for our church and their heart to get the gospel to the world their heart to get the bible in the hands of people who've never had the word of god lord i pray that you'll continue to help us to keep uh, the, the vision that you have that we would want to preach the gospel to the entire world and so lord i pray your blessing upon each individual here god dismiss us with your care make us mindful you'll go with us and lord 
I pray that we'd reach our Jerusalem right here. There's lost people all over Grove City in Columbus, Ohio. Lord, help us to be witnesses for thee. May others see Christ in our lives. Lord, use us for your honor and your glory. And we pray it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Well, the windows of heaven are open. The blessings are falling tonight. It's 128 in the book if you need it. And uh, let's sing that chorus together, shall we? The windows of heaven are open. The blessings are falling tonight. There's joy, joy, joy in my heart since Jesus made everything right. I gave him my old tattered garment. He gave me a robe of pure white. I'm feasting on manna from heaven. And that's why I'm happy. That's why you're happy. That's why we're happy tonight. God bless you. You're dismissed. Choir, you will have practice. <laughs>